Uh, to kick things off by a show of hands, how many of you were forced to read either the Odyssey or the Iliad in middle school? Wow, that's a lot. Okay, great. Um, that had nothing to do with this presentation. It was just an icebreaker, so I appreciate everyone participating. Um, what we are going to be talking about today is something that has been permeating a lot of panels yesterday and today, which is influencer marketing. So first and foremost, my name is Karen Swanson. I head up strategic partnerships at Julius. Uh, Julius is an influencer marketing platform with teams in New York, Boston, Chicago, uh, and San Francisco. Uh, we help agencies and brands such as Nike, AT&T, and TikTok uh, manage and streamline their influencer programs. I have been with Julia since 2014. In addition to onboarding partnerships, I also help work with uh, the leading social platforms, the Instagrams, Pinterest, Twitch, uh, Twitters of the world to integrate with their APIs. So that's something I'm currently learning about. The team also wanted me to put some personality in here. They apparently think I'm a robot, so uh, it was Danny's idea. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, I'm firmly Team Gryffindor. If anyone's a Harry Potter fan, I'm more than happy to talk about both that and influencer marketing after the panel. Uh, in my five years at Julius, I've obviously seen a lot of change in the influencer industry, uh, so I'm happy to talk shop. We also are going to have an ebook that you can download right out front uh, of the doors to the stage about the insights that you're going to learn about today. So I feel like a lot of the panels have been great about teaching marketers how to engage and work with influencers, uh, but we're actually going to present insights directly from over 300 influencers we surveyed uh, with, uh, in partnership with Lippy Taylor, which is a digital and PR agency. So we did a survey of over 300 influencers, asked them a lot of questions. What you're going to see here is a summary of those insights, and then we'll kick it off with a Q&A uh, with real live influencers in the flesh. So first and foremost is respecting an influencer's creativity. Pretty straightforward. Uh, it's okay to give direction, but allow the influencer to use their own creativity for a genuine, authentic post. Always got to have the word authenticity. It's such a buzzword. I really dislike it, but it makes sense when you hear the fact that 74% of influencers are simply motivated by the opportunity to be creative or be more creative in working with a brand. So just that alone is an exciting factor when a brand is reaching out to work with them. Um, and a number that's down from last year, which we're excited to see, only 18% of creators still think that a lack of creative control is a barrier in the relationship or partnership with a brand. So that number has decreased. Uh, I don't need to preach to a room full of marketers the uh, effect that empathy can have in reaching your target audience and conveying a relatable message. Same goes when either working with an influencer for their content, but also communicating with them. If you're empathetic, treat them like humans. Sorry, I feel a little funny talking about it when there's three influencers right over there, but treat influencers like humans. Uh, that will help create content that's more relatable, utilitarian, and entertaining. Next insight was on being a good partner. Be informed and know as much about the influencer as you would like them to know about your brand. I think this one's particularly interesting because I think there are some pretty stringent standards on influencers to know everything about the brand, whether they're reaching out to the brand or vice versa. They're expected to know the brand's mission, aesthetic, um, its team structure even, or the details of the brief, but those uh, expectations aren't met back on the brand. So do your homework. Know who you're talking to beforehand. It's going to make the whole partnership um, more trusting and authentic from the start. 66% of influencers surveyed are motivated by a desire to share their passion and expertise. They have a skill set, a passion, expertise, something that they know better than someone else or have a unique lens that they look at through it. That's something that they want to share. That's something to keep in mind when you're reaching out to influencers. Don't pray and spray. There is a place for mass messaging when it's done right and you really get it right and it's genuine, but personalized and customized outreach uh, really sparks relationships. Same goes for dating apps. You can translate this advice. Uh, don't make it generic. Uh, I also find it interesting, the last point on this screen, but well, they did tell me I have a laser that no one's been using. So. Um, Get specific for storytelling. We had a list of topics that influencers could choose from, and 10% still wrote in other because they felt that their content was too niche to fall into our pretty diverse topics that we listed. Uh, remember the little guy or gal. Look into the quality of the work versus likes or followers. You want natural engagement because it's more likely to convert organically. I think everyone knows with some of the changes Instagram is testing out with likes uh, and engagement in general, that this is a point that really hits home. 
Uh, 38% of influencers said they have had posts amplified by paid ads on a brand channel. Same reasons why you would put paid behind your own brand's channel content is why you'd want to do so uh, in tandem with influencer content. You can target more specific audiences that you're trying to reach, you can increase impact, and you can elevate the story they're trying to tell on behalf of your brand. Uh, we also have some information that we've put together on this if anyone's interested in discussing after the panel. Offering a fair value exchange. Please consider the time that it takes to travel to locations and production time to produce videos, write blogs, and edit photography. Offering just comped food or products does not cover our expenses. We had a panel uh, last year in LA where an influencer said, I really love that hairbrush you gave me, but that does not pay my bills. It doesn't leave the lights on. Uh, they were being a little tongue in cheek, but that's a really relevant point to bring up here. 52% uh, of influencers consider negotiating fair value exchange the biggest challenge. It's very clear that nobody uh, actually likes to negotiate, whether that's in real life or in influencer marketing. Here are a few tips to make it a little bit less painful. Uh, especially if you cannot offer a monetary compensation, that's a whole other negotiation process on its own. But if you're not able to do that, really think about the value you're bringing to someone. Do you hit an audience that they're struggling to reach? Do you have personal connections or professional connections within your network that they would love to get an introduction to? Can you bring them onto your team and have them shadow for a day and actually learn a skill set that would otherwise take them a master class or time out of their day to learn? Anything like that that can help someone who has an entrepreneurial mindset uh, get ahead is, is something that you could be looking into from what your brand can give to them other than uh, product or monetary compensation. Also, just be clear about what the value exchange is so both parties are understanding what's happening and it's not a, an uneven or imbalanced relationship. Communicating clearly, good lesson for all life relationships. Be clear and upfront about campaign goals, content information, and payment rates for campaigns. Seems pretty straightforward, but when you see how many of these influencers said that they're managing everything by themselves, let's do a laser again, uh, in case you can't see that, uh, that's a lot of time, whether it's a full-time job. Tyler, one of the influencers coming up, has a full-time job, but also has her channel and her podcast. That's a lot of time that goes into that. So again, be empathetic. You're working with humans. You've been there. We've all had um, balancing work-life struggles. This is something that can help that relationship uh, thrive. Uh, and least of all, if something does go wrong, if you have things in writing, you can hold people accountable. And that is something that doesn't have to be seen as a negative, but just being very clear and upfront. There's no reason to have any sort of skeletons in the closet or feel ashamed or, you know, this is going to ruin a potential partnership if I don't tell them this objective or KPI. Put it in there, put it in the brief, just be very direct as to why those things are important. If that influencer thinks it's unrealistic for them to hit those objectives or meet those deadlines, you can use a tool like Julius to find someone else who is going to be a good fit uh, for that relationship. So that way you're not halfway down the line and someone pulls out and says, oh, I can't do this. Especially if it's written down, you have something to fall back on. Uh, a good POV on our point is have your contracts written up ahead of time, your briefs, your contracts, SOWs, everything. Things can move a lot more quickly than you anticipate. You don't want to be then bogged down by the legal details. So get your ducks in a row uh, before that. So before I introduce our panelists, I did want to add that um, I know influencer marketing has been really just saturating the panels over the past two years of coming to Social Media Week. And something I had meant to bring up at the beginning is that um, you know, from Edelman's panel and Social Chain's panel, I really think that Andy King's panel yesterday um, who was in that panel? Raise your hands. Yes, I think it really blew the competition out of the water, pun intended. So I uh, think that that was really relatable, but he has nothing on the next three panelists that I'm about to introduce. So without further ado, please welcome to the stage Tyler Grove, Matt Nadeau, and Timothy De La Ghetto. Thank you. I think I butchered your last name after asking you. <laughs> no, no, you got it. Great. Well, thank you three for joining me today. Um, and I have a few questions to kick it off, but I think it will be easiest if you all introduce yourselves, because I will, uh, you'll do a better job explaining who you are. So Tyler, if you want to kick it off. Yeah. Hi, everybody. First off, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am Tyler. I'm the founder of We Traveled Where, which is a podcast and also a website. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Flock HQ, which is a digital marketing agency for influencers. So we actually help influencers on the back end with their marketing efforts, similar to how you would do with brands. And exactly like you were saying earlier, I also work full-time at a marketing agency, which is the sister agency to 
Block HQ, Hawk Media, um, and I run or help run their content team. So I do social media, influencer marketing for brands, as well as content production. Great. So. <laughs> wears many hats. Yeah, wears many hats and touches influencer marketing from two different sides of the game. Thank you. How Thanks. do you follow that up? <laughs> Jeez Louise. All right, uh, my name is Matthew Nidu. Um, I work in the influencer space, so partnering obviously with brands and doing sponsorship posts and that whole world. I also have um, a podcast called Good AF. If you don't know what AF means, Google that. Um, <laughs> and then I work with my girlfriend. We have a consulting company together called Sherpa Consulting. So we also work on both sides where you know, I'm kind of in front and behind the camera, if, if exactly. you can relate to that. So. Uh, yeah, it's awesome, and I, I appreciate being here. Thank you so much. Of course. And it is great to be with, you know, a collaboration of people who understand both sides of, of the world. Great. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, I'm Timothy De La Ghetto. I've been creating YouTube content for, like, uh, over 13 years now. So, like, before monetization, <laughs> when it was just for, you know, fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I've been on YouTube for a long time. I was on an MTV show called Wildin' Out for like the past six years. And, um, and now I, I host a food show on Thrillist called Send Foods. And um, I got a podcast too called No Chaser, if you guys want to listen to another podcast. <laughs> and um, and uh, I just bought a house, so I'll sell anything. Let me, get, let me you know, uh, <laughs> you got to pay that mortgage. Just let me know. So I wore this Taco Bell sweater so you guys know I'm ready to be a billboard. So hit me. <laughs> you gotta show it a little more. Yeah, Taco Bell. Get a nice photo. <laughs> Great. Well, it's got a little hot sauce stain right there. <laughs> yeah, it really does. <laughs> <laughs> Authentic. <laughs> so, it sounds like everyone's gonna have their homework on listening to all your podcasts. Uh, thank you again for coming. I am, first question uh, going back to the uh, respecting influencers' creativity. Tim, this one's for you. Okay. Why should a <laughs> Why should a brand trust you with the creative output? Um, you know, I, I love when a brand. Even if they're lying, if they tell me, they're like, hey, man, we know that you know your audience, and you know, we know that whatever like, you come up with is going to do the best with your audience. You know? Because like, obviously, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, the people that watch my video, they know my content, and I, I know my audience. Like, my favorite thing is when a brand is like, hey, here's what we want to get across. What are your ideas, like, and what can we do to, you know, get every, what everybody wants together in one like, nice little package, you know? Like my favorite, one of my favorite brand deals was Jack in the Box, and they hit me and they were like, hey, um, we got this, like, you know, our brand is really quirky and weird. We know you do weird shit too. That wasn't exactly what they said, but they're like, hey, we do, you know, you do weird shit. Come up with something weird for us. And I was like, oh, amazing, this is my favorite. Give me the check, let's get it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think, so I think that just, it works out best for everybody because when, when you're making content, your audience knows when it's not authentic, you know right. what I'm saying? And um, I will like rarely turn down a brand deal uh, unless it just, unless what they want to do is so completely different than what I do normally that it just, it, no one's going to be happy with it, you know? Mm. Right. So. Um, anyone else have follow-up on that? No. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I totally agree <laughs> with you. It's hard to follow that. I mean. I also do weird shit. Uh, <laughs> no, it, like, to what you said, for them to trust you, it's like, you want to reach out to our audience. There's obviously a reason why you connected with, you know, this influencer, because you see that they hold value in whatever their space may be. Right. So, like, if for me, you're right in the sense that sometimes, like, I, I just got, like, a package the other day for, for a company, and they're like, hey, they're like an alcohol company doing whatever. So they, they shot me over their stuff, signed a little contract, but when I got the stuff, it was all like women's like manicure, uh, like face mask and nail polish and a big bottle of rosé. And I was like, what the hell do I do with this? Like, that, that's not me, you know what I mean? So, um, so for something like that, that, that just seems weird for me. But for the most part, like I know my audience and I know my audience like, like beard stuff, guys like beards, you know? <laughs> yeah, so. it works well. That's what I like to hit, and you know, I know my audience in that. So how important is it for any of you to be a fan of the brand that's reaching out ahead of time? Hmm. For, for me, it's kind of everything, honestly. Kind of, my audience is based on like serious trust. A lot of my followers, I'll engage with them. Um, 
outside of like the actual visual feed of Instagram. Um, and it all stems back for me for trust. So I have to be a fan of the brand for me in order to get, engage with them and actually promote it. Um, I want it to be something that I would be fine with my face plastered on the side of like Times Square for um, and really be able to stand behind it. For me, that's just everything. Um, and it also helps because I do have a full-time job on the side, so I'm not completely reliant on the money that's coming in through Influencer. Um, I'm able to kind of have both sides of it so I can be a little bit more particular with the brands that I work with. Um, but for me, yeah, authenticity is absolutely everything. And being a fan of the brand is something that I hold like very strong to the core values of what I present on both my podcast and my blog. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, <laughs> depends on how much they're paying, man. Um, <laughs> Like, I'm going to give you both sides of the spectrum, all right? Yeah. <clears throat> For example, there was, a, there was this company that wanted to give me uh, one of their special little, like, um, like, figurines that they only did a handful of, and, um, and they wanted me to promote, like, a contest, you know? And I knew that these were, like, a really rare little figurine. Um, and for, for, like, the type of Instagram, like, shout out they wanted, um, they were like, hey, we can't compensate you, but we'll give you one of these. And I was like, shit, I really want it. <laughs> so I was like, okay, cool, we're good. <laughs> but um, on the other side, you know, there was an app for a, a game that I, I, I've never played in my life, you know. Yeah. But, but the, the check was good. So I was like, yeah, cool, let's, let's do it. And, uh, and that's it. <laughs> Did you play the app after that? Um, no. No. <laughs> but I told them it was the most fun game ever. There you know you what I'm saying? And here's the thing about it too: is like, okay, they might be a little different for me because I'm super transparent with my audience. Right. So my audience, and they're also they skew a little older, so they know that when I have a hashtag ad or I'm like, yo, this video or whatever is sponsored by this company, they're like, okay, Tim, get your money, get your check. So they know I'm not playing fucking Candy Crush, you know? <laughs> but they're like, cool, man, get your money, you know? Yeah. Um, so I can, I can be, uh, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It works for you. But a lot of people, you know, I feel like younger audiences, they might be like, like, you know, oh my God, I can't believe you sold out. We're so disappointed in you. But my audience, I don't care. No. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you look at the same thing as like an actor or, you know, something like that. Like, what's the difference between CNM on TV doing something? Right. You know what I mean? Like Brett Favre wearing Wranglers. Right. You yeah. know what I mean? Does he, I've seen him wear Levi's before. Like, come on, man. <laughs> Um, it's something like that, but for me, I think authenticity, or, or something that, that is in, uh, a brand that I believe and I care in and I support, that, that plays a lot for me. Um, I'm coming from like an entertainment background where I used to just audition for everything, and I think the turning point for me is I didn't book something. I was on like first refusal and I didn't get it, and I was all upset. And when I thought about it, I was like, I fuck. Excuse me. Can I, yeah. I fucking hate that brand. <laughs> I would never eat there. I would never go there. What am I so upset that I didn't book this for? Right. And it was this awesome thing to be able to come back onto, you know, in social media and be able to be like, you know what? I can take this, and I don't have to take this, and my whole life isn't relying on that. Yeah, you're in control. Yeah. I think it's different on social versus acting, just in terms of accountability. And you both said it in two different ways. Tim's yeah. audience is like, go get your money, like power to you, and your audience like that's. You don't like that restaurant. We've we've heard you hate that on that <laughs> restaurant. Go on a rant on your story. So it does go both ways, and that's what you build your channel on. There's no right or wrong answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I kind of had both, like the, yeah. both of those things happen in, in one brand deal because it was a company that I had talked about uh, negatively in the past, <laughs> and then and then I did the brand deal. But like, luckily for me. Uh, I did a video um, in the past after talking all this shit about this company where I actually chose them out of a blind taste test. So when I did the brand deal and my, my viewers were like, dude, why you talk so much shit about this company? Why are you doing a brand like, Well, they were laughing, you know, LOL, get their money, whatever. But I was also like, but don't forget, guys, there was this one video where I chose them, so ha. So it, it was okay. Yeah. Do you have a tatted get your money on your <laughs> Get that money. That get that money. Tattoo, yeah. um, well, Tyler, we were talking about brands that we love and brand deals that we love. Yeah. Can you tell us in you know, 30 seconds to a minute about you know, the best brand deal to date, what that entails, and why it was so good? Yeah. Um, my favorite brand deal, and to this 
day. I absolutely stand by this brand with everything. But I've been working with Kula Sun Care since I started this whole path down influencer marketing. Um, I was a total nano influencer at the time when I first started working with them. Um, I'm from San Diego. Kula's headquarters are in Carlsbad, which if you know the area, it's right down the street. Um, and I ran into their product at a local store. I smelled it. I was like, this mango sunscreen, I need it. This smells amazing. <laughs> bought it myself, brought it home, started posting it to all my followers. And at the time, this was four years ago. So I really didn't have a following. It was very nano. Um, and the company reached out and they just said, hey, we love your content. We'd love to work with you. Can we start using your content on our newsletters? And I said, oh my gosh, by all means, stand by you guys with everything. I love what you guys are doing. Um, now take it around four years later. I work with the company almost every single month. Um, I do tons of work with them. Every time they have new products, I actually at one point was doing product testing for them. So they'd send me products. I'd tell them what I thought about it and was just super honest with the brand. And it's turned into this amazing partnership because we started super organically. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something for any brands out there that is are looking for more of like the brand ambassador role and somebody for more longer term partnerships. Don't forget about like those nano influencers or people that you might be seeing on social media that are posting about your brand that might have two or 3,000 followers because in three to five years from now, they might be the people with 100,000 followers, 500,000 followers. Um, this right. whole industry is ever changing and you really want to capitalize on the people who start talking about you from the start. Um, and that's really what Kula did for me and that's why to this day, I'm really close with their entire team. I love the founder. Everybody at that company is just so sweet. And they go above and beyond for me as well, which I think um, just speaks volumes to the brand itself. Um, but like I said, pay attention to social listening if you're a brand out there. Um, I think that's super important. And that's really how you're going to find your brand ambassadors from the start. Great advice. Yeah. Matt, what about you? Is there a brand that you've loved, loved working with? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I've worked with a lot of awesome brands. Um, I did one with Maker's Mark and United by Blue, which I love Maker's Mark, and United by Blue is from Philly, and I'm from Philly, so I had that, yeah, go birds. So one Philly's person. <laughs> no, there's, oh, yeah. We're everywhere. You can't get away from us. Um, but that was really cool because they did this whole, like, uh, they, they did a really cool campaign with it, and it was awesome. It was all about, like, cleaning our waterways and being socially, you know, conscious. Mm -hmm. or, I mean, environmentally conscious. And that was really cool, but I think the, the, the most exciting one I did to date is we just did one with this Australian company called Travelers Auto Barn, and they're like these uh, Ford vans that they convert into like camper vans, right? So this is one, in, they gave us in exchange for like content, they're like, hey, you can have this for like two weeks. We're from Australia. We don't know anything about America. Like their hashtags were like horrible because it, was, it didn't translate from you know Aussie to US. So we basically just took this thing, ran it like three thousand miles all over like the West Coast, and we just hit like every national park that we love, and uh, we kind of combined it with some other stuff, which everything kind of worked out. Yeah. But that was awesome because they were like, here, we trust you guys. Just make whatever the content is that you want to make. Just make our van look cool. So that was awesome because I already know the national parks and I know, right. you know, where the cool spots are in America. So that that was a super fun and like very authentic. And not only that, but it was something that like anybody can do. Like for me, I love to travel and you know to jump on a plane sometimes. Like that's not feasible if you have kids or whatever. Mm -hmm. But to take like a weekend long road trip and this little thing that feels like home, that was really cool. Yeah. That lit me up. More accessible. Um, in terms of knowing you guys and, and what a brand should know about you before they reach out, what is your advice to anyone in this room in terms of doing their homework? Like, do you want them to have, you know, just specifically looked through your website, your content, your bio, or, or have specific things they know about you so that if they reached out and said, hey, like, Matt, I know you love to take road trips, what's going to click with you with all the emails you're getting from different brands? Um, you you want to know something just simple that always makes emails stand out to me? Um, you, you mentioned earlier when people like mass email, mm -hmm. right? Whenever an email says, hi, Timothy, instead of hi, Timothy de la Ghetto, I'm like, oh, okay, this is a real person. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I'm more likely to, to reply. Because when it's just like, hi, Timothy de la Ghetto, I'm like, mm, they probably just copied and pasted this, yeah. you know? When it says, hey, Timothy, or hey, Tim, I'm like, oh, cool. Or, and usually if the opening line is like, hey, your blah, blah, blah video is so funny. It's like, oh, okay, this person is actually, you know, they're familiar with my content. 
they're you know they're they're down to work because yeah. also you know like my content's not necessarily like family friendly, so it's <laughs> <laughs> it's annoying you when a company <laughs> hits me up to work and I'm like hey here are my ideas and they're like hey can you not do this and this and that I'm like well bruh what did you expect you yeah. know so mm-hmm. you know it's nice to know a little bit at least yeah do and then just tell me how much <laughs> tell it right away you want that in the initial outreach I, I'm I, honestly like yeah I don't mind that either. When it's like, hey, look, uh, this is what we want to do. Um, and then as soon as I say, hey, I'm down, I'm like, I'm down. Let's get into numbers right away. Like, yeah. you know, fuck the bullshit. Don't you know beat around the bush. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you read every email that comes into your inbox? Or yeah, like, I do. You do? I, I personally do, yeah. Okay. I, I try to stay on top of my emails because um, I just I don't trust anybody. Uh, so we're learning a lot about you. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very in my emails. I know not a lot of people are like, uh, but I just I prefer that. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, when I negotiate myself, I negotiate under the name Jasper. Yeah. Well, now they all know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> change your you know, I'll, I'll change it. I'll change, change it. it Cause you know, it's weird to negotiate by yourself. Like I do have like an, an agent, and like I, I've worked with different companies and stuff. But you know, it's weird to negotiate. As yourself, so I'll usually yeah. be like, "Oh, okay. Well, Tim usually does this for that. Uh, thanks." Uh, Why yeah. is that though? I don't know, man. It's, it feels weird. Yeah, it feels weird to like. It's almost like asking someone's age. You know, it's like it's taboo. So yeah. I just would rather just reply as twenty-nine Jasper. to thirty-two. <laughs> <laughs> Safe bet. Uh, what about you two? Anything you want the brand to know about you, particularly? That was very particular, so I love that. But it doesn't have to be as specific as that. Yeah, I think um, when you're approaching influencers and reaching out and doing your research prior, remember that influencers and content creators in general are like super multifaceted. We have lots of different things beyond just our social channels. Mm -hmm. Um, We have, all of us three have podcasts. We all do other things outside of just what you see maybe on like a static image. Mm -hmm. Um, So paying attention to those pieces of the pie, for example, like if you went to my Instagram feed right now, Um, you'd probably think I solo travel. Like every single one of my photos is me alone at a destination, um, purely because my family refuses to be in any photo. um, (laughs) And anybody I bring hates the camera. So it has nothing to do with the fact that I solo travel. It just has to do with the fact that nobody will be in the photo with me. So, and you wouldn't even get that from my captions, but if you listen to my podcast, if you read my blog, you'd know that I travel with other people. So I think it's really important to kind of see the more holistic landscape of whoever that influencer or content creator might be. Um, And then also see like the nuances to who they are. Yes, they might be a travel influencer or a food influencer, but what are those niche areas that they also might dip into that make them a little bit different than the next influencer that comes along? Um, I also do a lot in sustainability um, and oceans. So take a look at that. Um, And you can see that from all of us probably on like our podcast topics. Like what do we want to speak to and what stories are we trying to tell there? Um, So it's really more just like looking at all of the different areas Mm -hmm. that we're on instead of just focusing on one or two platforms. I love that. Man, you really know your shit. (laughs) (laughs) I'm learning so much today. Uh, no, I, I, yeah, I, I agree with you there. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Same Z's. Okay. Same Z's. I agree. All right, fair enough. Um, Tim, question for you. When did you, Tim, Timothy, <laughs> Timothy De La Guetta. Personal preference, yeah. Personal. Um, Jasper, <laughs> thank you. When, when did you feel like you really came into your own? You've been doing this for quite some time. You've seen a lot of changes, like you said, pre-monetization. Yeah. Maybe for fun, maybe for entertainment for yourself and your friends, whatever yeah. reason. When was kind of like my aha, I made it moment? Was it like the first check? Was it Taco Bell? Yeah. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say it was necessarily a, a, a ha ha, I made it moment, but um, I remember the, the week <laughs> that I got fired from my job at California Pizza Kitchen. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I had just a won, I won a YouTube contest, and right. it was, um, and I, I had built enough of a following that you know the, the the people like voted for my video. I mean, it was a good video too, but it was just like <laughs> so. I won this this HP laptop like creative make a video contest, and it was like for like fifteen thousand dollars, right? It was like biggest check I ever I had ever gotten, right. and um, and I was like, yo, I can. Um, I can actually be okay not working like a real job for a bit, and um, and that really helped me like focus on my content and have time to really like really do it. You know what I'm saying? And then after that, I uh, man, I was like almost 10 years ago. I haven't worked a real job since. You know what I'm saying? So that was like the turning point. I feel right. Yeah. Mm. So did you ever look back and say, 
Hmm, maybe ah, I could have been the boss at CPK. Yeah. No. <laughs> Damn. Have you been back to that CPK since? Oh, dude, I love CPK. Yeah, I go all the time. The specific one you were fired from, have you gone back to that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. Long Beach, Marina. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> well, do you have any advice to anyone else who's in the still working at CPK and trying to make videos on the side stage? Uh, I, I would say uh, if you're going to tweet about work, <laughs> don't tag CPK. <laughs> Or do that on purpose so you can get fired and go, you know, do this for a living. <laughs> All right. Two, two different paths to take yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, it's your choice. Uh, Matt, question for you next. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, do you like working with other influencers? And if so, how? And that could be, all right, I want to work with Tyler and, and collaborate on a trip to Joshua Tree. Or it could be, I know that that alcohol brand wants all five of us to participate in something. I'm going to collaborate or I'm going to work in a silo. Do you have a preference? Do you have a lot of experience with those collaborations? I haven't. Um, to add to the last thing that you said, I really do like when people send me something that's like, oh, hey, Matthew, um, love this post that you did on whatever. Right. Like, I, I do appreciate that kind of stuff. So not to just We say, get it. Okay. But anyway, uh, back <laughs> to that. You keep talking if you want to. I haven't, um, I haven't done, like, a lot of collaborations with other influencers, to be honest with you. But it's something that I've definitely been, like, looking into. Uh, particularly people that kind of line up. Like, we, I brought this up to my girlfriend the other day. I was like, oh, man, like, look at these six guys that, like, I love all the stuff that they're doing, and they're just, like, setting up something, and they're just going out, and they're just doing all the stuff together and just traveling all over, right. taking, like, three months and just going to destinations that, by default, look awesome for a brand to partner with them, and they're in whatever place that is. So I haven't, been, I haven't really done that yet. I mean, there's a lot of things that um, I'll do... I'll do something for like a brand and it'll be like just say 10 other people and they want everybody to kind of collaborate and kind of get to know each other, mm -hmm. like that kind of thing. Um, but depending on who the influencer is, sometimes that's just superficial and I, I don't really want to do that. Right. But definitely I think that that's something, not I think, that is something I really want to do as far as collaborating and really like bringing what I'm good at and what somebody else is good at and kind of our two point of views on however, you know, we present it and coming together. Yeah. Well, you might have so if you know anybody, two people uh, I would to love work to with do you that. here. I well, you're a solo traveler. Yeah, no. You need some friends. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Take zone. I was going to say, I, yeah. I can't, I can't <laughs> grow a beard. I, I got nothing for you, bro. <laughs> you got the food. You got the food. Yeah, yeah I'm out on that too. You can get you fired from CPK, but like, you can't. Sure. What about you? Yeah, I think working with other influencers is so much fun. I think. Honestly, like the influencer space is great because so many people are so creative. So if you can loop up with those people who might piggyback on things that you're already interested in, it just helps grow your brand in general. Um, in addition, it honestly like sparks creativity. Everybody is thinking of the industry in a slightly different way. And although it might look like we know everything we're doing on the back end, we don't always know what we're doing. So it's great to like actually talk to other people, say, hey, did this work for your audience? Maybe it'll work for mine. So I think having those conversations offline, also in more intimate settings before you actually like go into any kind of collaboration or partnership with any other influencers is super important in my book. Um, so anybody I've ever worked with, like, I'll go grab coffee. Like, let's go see if we actually mesh in real life before we, like, go into working together for a brand or working together on anything else. And when it comes to, like, actually working with other influencers, something that I love that brands do is they'll bring us together in a more intimate setting. So say it's, like, a group of five to ten influencers that a brand is working with to promote a new product. I love when the brand will bring us in. We'll do either, like, a mini pop-up shop, get to experiment with the product all kind of together in a much more intimate, natural setting that might not be the core that you're actually posting about, but it allows you to experience other influencers and the product um, firsthand without it having to, like, immediately go on social media. Yeah, because people can read through that if it's a, exactly. not a mesh in real life, as you mm -hmm. said. You see that on yeah. social, something can seem a little off. Yeah. Um, last question for the group, which I think is a fun one for everyone, hopefully. Um, <laughs> if, you're, if someone cannot pay you and it's not monetary compensation, we already know that Tim loves the figurines. So <laughs> he's sold on that. Mm -hmm. But what is it, and I know it's so case by case, brand by brand, but what are you looking for particularly that personally, too, that, you know, if a skill set, something else, a product, whatever it may be, that can help you if it's not compensation? For me, it's really more of the intimate experiences that I wouldn't be able to have otherwise. Um, I think something that I recently did, for example, um, I went and stayed at this incredible hotel down in San Diego, and with that, I was able to experience it in a much different light, um, whether that is work 
being able to have a private dinner where you're actually able to try some of the food the chef makes. Like, I'm a big foodie, so things like that for me go a long way. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of just adding those extra value points that you might not be able to experience otherwise, that your followers are also going to say, oh, hey, that's cool, that's different. Mm -hmm. It's not just, um, here's like some extra product or something like that. It's going the extra step and the extra mile to figure out what's really going to make that influencer tick um, and make them say, oh, wow, that's actually a really cool experience I can have from it. So for me, it's more of like that added value of an experiential piece of a partnership that would really kind of push it over the edge if I wasn't able to have cash payout. Great. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. For me, it's the experiences as well. Like the Traveler's Auto Barn I was talking about, that was, they just gave us the van. Like we didn't get paid for that, but we were more than willing to, to take that and to just like know that we we're going to have a blast. Right. Because there was a lot less um, pressure, too, as far as the content that had to be made, right. which was, you know, that's always a relief. But I think for me, um, you're right, like, a lot of times, like, initially when I, when I first started doing this stuff, like, I would get, like, beard products, and, like, that was awesome. But now that we built three extra shells for beard products, and I'm giving <laughs> it to, like, my brother who can't grow facial hair now, and I'm just like, here, just take this stuff, use it on your hair or something, um, that really serves no value for me. Yeah. So, like you said, um, dinner experiences are always. Like, I, I think it's things that you normally wouldn't, that you normally wouldn't get to do. It's access. Yeah, yeah. it's a, yeah. That's that's awesome. Like that access mm -hmm. to be able well, to go. Hey, we can put yeah. you here, and, and you can have this experience, and you know, you can authentically enjoy it. Right. And if, like, you're a beard company, you can make a really cool experience out of it. Like, don't think that you just have to be, like, a restaurant to do an experiential thing. Like, no. think outside of the box if you're, like, a standalone product um, yeah. and create an experience, whether that's, like, collabing with a restaurant and doing, like, a whiskey and beard situation. You know what I mean? Like, making yeah. it a little bit more exciting. <laughs> well, something like that, like, Is that yeah. a on purpose? <laughs> yeah, whiskey and, yeah, but even I'm something good. like that where it's like, oh, I'm so, rugged, I'm outdoors all yeah. the time. Like, it's cool to have your beard stuff or whatever, but mm -hmm. like make it an experience where it's like exactly. maybe a bunch of dudes go out to like Yosemite, have like this cabin and they do whatever it is that they do. Exactly. And then build around that. Shave each other's beards. Yeah. Get no one's doing anything with razors. <laughs> I met the Dollar Shave Club guy and someone's like, oh, you, you guys would get along. I was like, why? <laughs> <laughs> anti everything I'm about. Dollar beard fight. Uh, you know, I, I co-sign everything they just said. I mean, especially now that... Um, you know, now like I'm married, so if ever I can have some like fun experience where I can take her that I wouldn't normally like have access to, like yeah, we can we can go to restaurants and stuff. But you know, if um, if uh, if if someone is like hey, offering some type of unique dinner experience, and 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 when they know that it's not going to be some type of monetary compensation, and it's not a super like hey, make sure you post three posts or whatever. They're like hey, if you want to, it'd be great. You know, mm -hmm. if you had a good time, post something for us. That'd be great. I'm like, all right, fine. You know, then I it's will. like, cool. Yeah. Like, you know, we both yeah. get something out of it, and it's not traditionally what we would normally do. But like, yeah, cool. Let's do that. Works for me. It's fun for everybody. Because you're always gonna post, regardless. Like, I know. That's yeah, the I'm thing. So yeah. You, you know, we're always posting. looking for content. That's the thing, right? <laughs> Especially if I'm doing some cute shit with wifey. It's like she had so many likes. You know. So. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> good for engagement. You know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I. How many? We have two minutes left. Do we have time for like one or two questions? I see a hand. Do you want to just stand up and say it loud? If you could say where you work and your name. Hi, my name is Alex. I work for a clothes brand called Pretties. Uh, we do pretties a lot and organic combinations. But I was wondering if you guys ever get overwhelmed with the amount of stuff you have on your phone. Like, let's say you get these PR boxes like every single day. You kind of just don't know what to do with it. Like, is there a way you can kind of combat that? Or like, if you dealt with it, like, what do you do with that stuff that comes in? So just to repeat her question, she said, what do you guys do with the amount of stuff that comes in, whether it's a PR box or 10 zillion things related to a beard? Um, <laughs> just, just how do you manage that type of influx of product? For me, like, I have two sisters, so they love me. Because um, <laughs> anything that I don't use or, like, I have too much of, just, like, it's funneled down the pipeline to them. They're like, this is great. Or um, some of my friends, one of my best friends is sitting in the front row, and I, like I said, I help with Kula, and I'll just, like, kind of, like, pass the sunscreen on to, like, anybody that's around me. I'm like, here, take this, take this. Um, but I also think strategically you can do giveaways and things like that where you can actually engage with your audience and make mm -hmm. it more of an experience for them as well. Um, I think that's probably, like, the best way if you're trying to kind of, like, 
takes them off your plate and also gives give the love to everybody else. Great idea. Yeah. Agree. Yeah, I've, I've done the giveaway thing too. Yeah, yeah. good idea. And, and I think that's cool because it's following up whatever you just did so they know exactly. that you back that up as well. Yeah. Uh, one last question. So yeah, the question was, have you ever had an experience with a brand where you knew the relationship or, or the structure of the partnership wasn't going to work out, but you kind of forced a square peg into a round hole, whatever the phrase is? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I had a, um, I had, man, it was such a big brand deal, too. It was like so much money. It was so sweet. But like from the beginning, I was like, I don't know if this makes sense, right? Because it was with, um, it was with, it was with like a smaller beer company and they kind of wanted me to host some some events for them, and it was I'm sorry, like sorry, you said beer, beer. Yeah, I was like, yeah. you don't have a beard. Beard, beer, beer, not beard. <laughs> and it was a whole, it was a whole thing. It was like a whole package, right? And it was, um, and I was kind of traveling with them, but the whole time I was like, man, I don't know if this makes sense because, um, like, okay, so you know, I, on my channel, I also rap and stuff, you know, and and for example, the the first show we did, um, like the 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 main act was um. I think it was Third Eye Blind, you know? And I was like, I was like, cool, I like Third Eye Blind, but this nobody that came to this event watches my videos. Like this makes no sense. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It was where I was on stage, like, hey, what's up? And everyone and no one cared, yeah. you know? And I think we both understood that uh, this doesn't really make sense for anybody. And we were really trying to force it and make it happen, but it wasn't my demo. I definitely wasn't like my audience wasn't really trying to come out and watch Third Eye Blind, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it just wasn't working for anybody. And eventually you know, we both kind of had the same concerns. I still got the money, thank God. But we, we cut the deal, like, kind of halfway through. We're like, hey, this isn't working, but, hey, it is what it is. No you know? hard feelings. Yeah.